Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This uh, is an important day right across the street at the U.S. Supreme Court building. It's been interesting in the past, uh, most of the time that I'm aware of, when, when there was a matter coming before the Supreme Court, um, they observed what's called reciprocity, just as if a senator, a U.S. senator, wants to come down here and observe uh, they can't speak on the floor, but they can come to the House floor. Same way, we have reciprocity with the Senate. We can go down to the Senate and stand in the chamber and uh, uh, be there in person, as I've done when Rand Paul was doing uh, what amounted to a filibuster, when Ted Cruz was doing what amounted to a filibuster. And with the Supreme Court, uh, normally if there are members of Congress that are going to be coming, They'll reserve a bench, and there have been a couple of times that the bench was full and other members of Congress filled those spaces before I got there. But it's been an observation that since this body is charged with funding the Supreme Court and providing what they need, determining what they don't really need, uh, it's a part of reciprocity that they provide uh, those places to observe what's happening. I, I've been rather am, ambivalent. I can see both sides of the issues of cameras in the courtroom because as a judge, murder trials, other things of interest, cameras uh, or networks would want to come film. Had one case that went for 10 weeks. And we have very strict rules. We only allow one camera in the courtroom, could never be worked on during Anything uh, that was going on could never be a distraction at all. But I saw how cameras could work in the courtroom without being any problem at all. But here in Congress, I've fairly much taken the position that uh, if the camera's going to be in the courtroom, leave it up to the courts. But with the United States Supreme Court, as I've seen this week, there would be no harm in having a camera in somewhere in the courtroom where people didn't notice so that Americans could see, since we moved the Supreme Court toward being an oligarchy, we could see what they're doing, whether they're sleeping, whether they're participating, whether they're asking stupid questions. Uh, I went over, and since I'm uh, sworn in as a member of the Supreme Court bar, I was allowed to be in the overflow room and hear what was going on. So it was kind of difficult to really tell who was, was addressing what during the uh, case that the Supreme Court was hearing this morning, heard oral arguments on. But this is an extremely critical case. And I couldn't tell which judge asked the questions, but uh, when the Supreme Court is in effect expressing concern through their questions that a corporation, a for-profit corporation, could not possibly have uh, religious, firmly held religious beliefs, then it occurred to me, for heaven's sake, this Justice Department doesn't seem to have a problem indicting corporations. So if the Justice Department can indict a corporation and say they have intent to violate the law, well, if that corporation can have intent with regard to violations of the law, it certainly ought to be able to form the intent to have religious, firmly held religious beliefs. But it was shocking as I listened to questions from some of the Supreme Court justices today when that is compared with the history of the United States of America. And Roger Williams, for example, whose statue has been moved uh, last week, but how he formed Rhode Island because of his firmly held religious beliefs and his beliefs that there should be freedom of religion in America where the government does not interfere in any way. You compare the beliefs of the pilgrims who came from Holland to England and then here. They wanted religious 
freedom so they could they could serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They could follow their Christian without being persecuted or without having a government say, you don't have any right to practice those beliefs, compared with the Supreme Court justices, in effect, saying, gee, um, they could just pay the fine, and it'd be a lot cheaper than $475 million in penalties they'll have to pay. Uh, and actually, one justice had the nerve to say, uh, I believe they, that was called a tax and not a penalty. Paul Clement was doing a great job. My immediate thought was, well, no, the Supreme Court at page 15 of the majority opinion said clearly the mandate was a penalty. Congress called it a penalty. It clearly was a penalty. It's only assessed if you don't do what, what the bill requires people to do. So clearly it's a penalty. And since it's a penalty, they said at page 15, then we do have jurisdiction to go forward because the Supreme Court pointed out if that mandate were a tax, then under the anti-injunction statute, the Supreme Court would not have jurisdiction to have proceeded when they did, and the plaintiffs that brought the case would not have had uh, standing to bring the case. But they said since this is clearly a penalty and not a tax, then we can go forward because if it's a tax, any injunction act kicks in, we don't have jurisdiction at this time. But page 15, Supreme Court called it a penalty, and they, in that opinion, uh, apparently to the ignorance of our at least one of our Supreme Court justices, Supreme Court called it a penalty at page 15 because they quoted the Congress calling it a penalty in Obamacare, and they said clearly it is a penalty. We got jurisdiction. We'll go ahead and determine the rest of the case. Over about 40 pages, and then they determine, okay, now that we're hearing this because it's a penalty and not a tax, we determine it's a tax and therefore it's constitutional. It, and we know under the rules of this House that Supreme Court judges would not do anything appropriate, but, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that opinion was indecent. It was a travesty. It was hypocritical, that decision was. How you can call it a penalty at page 15 and then with a straight face, 40 page later, say, now it's a tax, so it's constitutional. And then stand, sit as they were today and have a justice say, well, kind of snidely, it was, we didn't call it a penalty. I mean, it was called a tax. Depends on where you look in the majority opinion as to whether it's a penalty or tax. But Congress clearly called it a penalty. I am very concerned. We had someone who was in a position with the executive branch when Obamacare was put together and pushed here in Congress, and in her position with the executive branch, at that time she had to either be incompetent and fail to give the executive branch any advice on its most important bill that they took up, or there was a lie told that, no advice was ever given about this bill. Either way, that justice should not have been allowed to be on, to hear this case as a member of the Supreme Court. Because clearly, and I think the questions that were apparently asked by her today show she was an advocate, is an advocate now, and most likely was an advocate in, in this administration. So this country's in trouble, and I have my dear friend from Minnesota.